Hey, what's up? What a special episode we have this time. My guest today is the guy responsible for your visual experience in Gears 5. And what an awesome game is Gears 5. I enjoyed every moment of it and it really took the series to somewhere I wasn't expecting. But man, I'm so happy about it. <laughs> One of the amazing aspects of Gears 5 for me was the visual of that game. It has such a well-polished, beautiful, and innovative look, so I thought it would be great to have a podcast with uh, no one but the amazing Ariane Hambick, art director at The Coalition. Now, I knew how talented this guy is, but what I realized after being in contact with him was the fact that he's such a humble, sweet, and kind man. Lucky are the people at The Coalition to have the chance to work with Aryan each day. In this episode, we talk about Aryan's background, growing up loving movies, getting his first gig in video games, working on Gears of War franchise, and leading the art team of Gears 5. This conversation is heaven for all the video game artists out there, and if you know someone who can use this and learn something from this episode, please send the conversation to him or her. <laughs> and also make sure to subscribe and follow the podcast on any uh, podcast app you're listening to also the video version of this conversation is on what's up conversations channel on youtube all right enough talk and let's go and have uh, more talk thank you very much Arian, to join me on this new episode of what's up conversations what a time it is for you releasing a mega successful badass piece of art named gears 5 after years of hard working how do you feel now that the game is finally out um, thanks. Uh, I feel ecstatic right now. Um, you know, we worked pretty hard for, for two, three years, I should say. And, um, you know, sometimes, uh, you put something together as an artist and you show it to people. And even though you think you've done your best work, people don't always appreciate it or, uh, receive it in the way that you think it should be received. So, um, being able to work with the team here at the coalition to put out gears, um, you know, we thought it looked really good, uh, and we just hoped that the audience would receive it, and and they have. So um, I'm really happy. Uh, everyone here is really happy. Kind of pinching myself still, uh, but um, yeah, very excited and very happy. Yeah. So I wanted to uh, I wanted to congratulate you and the whole team of the coalition for bringing back one of my favorite video game series. Seriously, after playing half an hour of Gears 5, I swear I was so close to dropping a tear because it reminded me <laughs> of my childhood, that same feeling of Gears, fighting monsters in an alien planet with a cool-ass squad. I can't wait for Gears 6 now, I, and I think it's going to be awesome. an all-out war next time. <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll, we'll start working on it right away. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So before we go deep into Gears 5... Let's talk about you. Where were you born? Tell me about childhood and deciding to work on video games. Sure. Um, I was born in Iran. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, you really, uh, I was so surprised by your email. It came with the subject of Salam, which in yeah, yeah. <laughs> means hello. And I was like, who is this guy? And turns yeah. out you're Iranian just like me. And also That's we right. have two uh, right. uh, artistic forces on gears five you and ramin javadi the composer of the that's game. right so, that's right yeah that's right so, <laughs> so you were born so yeah here. so we, yeah. we can talk about we can talk about that a little bit a yeah. little bit later but um yeah so i, I was born in iran uh, um and uh you know had i guess a i don't know a typical childhood i guess you could say and when i was seven years old uh my family moved to spain so i spent about three years in the south of Spain. Again, I was seven, seven years old. So I was just a kid, you know, doing what kids do, playing soccer, playing football, just, you know, having fun. Uh, eventually, my parents ended up moving with me, of course, to Denver, Colorado, uh, where we lived for about eight years. So I spent most of my, you know, elementary school, um, uh, you know, junior high and high school years in Denver. And so, um, uh, finally, at that point, we moved to Vancouver, Canada, which is where I've been since then, uh, which would be 1990 to present. Um, so I've kind of, you know, obviously moved around a lot with my family. 
um, but you know, uh, you know, have the Iranian culture sort of deep in my blood. Obviously, I was born there. I've lived there for seven years, and my family uh, culturally, uh, you know, has carried a lot of that that forward, no matter where we lived. So I definitely consider myself an Iranian, um, although I'm a Canadian citizen now. Uh, uh, but um, anyway, so as far as sort of artistic start, you know, I, I was always kind of interested in drawing and as a kid and would draw little uh, little pictures of and of little tanks and stuff like that. And and so that always carried through the years with me. And, you know, my my family was traditionally not super excited about me being or trying to make a career out of art. I think um, that mostly came out of them not really perhaps understanding the different avenues you could go yeah. into. Um, they sort of thought of it as as just traditional art. You know, you want to be a painter or something like that, which, as you know, is, is quite difficult to, to make it, you know. And so, you know, my dad and my uncle are both quite, quite talented. They both paint. Um, my uncle exhibits a lot of his work and he sells his work and stuff like that so you know they always saw it as, a, as something you would do on the side because oh. you know you get a proper career and you could still do art on the side so um so what so, kind of career did they, they didn't have in mind for you uh i mean you know my parents didn't really push me too hard on one specific career um, you know, my dad is, uh, my dad has a, uh, is from German descent. So, um, he's very much practical and, and, and always wanted me to pick something and work hard at it and, and make a practical decision that I could, you know, support myself and support my family and that kind of thing. So, um, so I, you know, they didn't really have anything specific in mind, but art wasn't one of those things. <laughs> so... So I think what happened is, you know, for a while I tried to sort of um, go down some traditional routes. I started uh, in university t taking sciences and I really didn't enjoy it that much. You know, it takes a lot of hard, hard work to, you know, to do well in school. And if you're not enjoying what you're studying, then it just feels like torture, you know. Yeah. So um, uh, I kind of ended up taking, uh, you know, I always was interested in history and of course, I'm interested in art, so I took an art history course just out of pure curiosity, and I ended up really, really enjoying it because it kind of put the two and two together of the things that I really enjoyed. So for my third and fourth year, I basically majored in art history. So I have a degree in art history, um, and uh, that left me with you know a fairly good knowledge of sort of the history of art and sort of why things are the way they are. But my fundamental sort of fine art skills didn't really get developed uh, there. So I spent um, some years after that taking a bunch of courses on just more fine art stuff like drawing, painting, composition, that kind of thing for two, two or three years at various uh, smaller schools in Vancouver just to try to improve my, my traditional skills. And um, at that point, uh, I wanted to get into the film industry as a VFX artist um, because, you know, I like movies and that seemed like a, um, a place where I could, you know, get into something that was creative and had art involved, but yet, you know, could be a feasible career. Uh, and so I went to a school named um, BCIT, British Columbia Institute of Technology, and I got a, a 3D animation certificate there. And as soon as I got out of school, I've got I got a bunch of interviews for um, uh, video game places, and you know, of course. So were you I played familiar video with video games back then? Uh, I was, uh, but it wasn't you know, your I, first choice. You wanted to work. It on wasn't movies. my first choice. You know, um, I played video games, of course, and and I had, uh, and I of course I grew up in a, in arcades as most kids did you know, um, with a pocket full of quarters and that kind of thing, and then moved on to, you know, uh, Atari and, and Nintendo and all this stuff, uh, and an Xbox. But um, anyway, I, I, you know, I, I wanted to just get started. I wanted to get my foot in the door, and uh, I started at a company called Radical Entertainment. Oh, and I remember, dude. Yeah, I, I worked on a couple of, of Simpsons games that people seem to like, and they're <laughs> super fun uh, to make and everyone you know Simpsons was a huge series back then so it was fun to work on but uh, as soon as I got into that industry everything just kind of clicked for me I really liked it I liked I liked you know I kind of liked being able to the idea of 
being able to put something together that that people can can you know interact with um and you know really brings joy to people and and of course throughout the years everything you know started to grow into bringing people together with social gaming and all this kind of stuff so um every year that went by i kind of i kind of really you know got more and more sort of entrenched and liked the game industry and i sort of one year i kind of thought to myself if i want to stick with this now's the time if i want to change and make a move to to film and vfx now's the time to do that and I decided that I kind of really was happy doing what I was doing, Why you know. Do so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Uh, looking back, I think it turned out okay. So, um, I kind of basically put that, that dream away and and focused on the, the new dream. And you know, from there, I you know I moved over to Electronic Arts in Vancouver, where I worked on a, a bunch of um, uh, titles, uh, sports titles, and that's sort of where I got my first taste of sort of leading a team and sort of a little bit of direction and, and so how old were you when you first started working on uh, in uh, free radical uh at radical i uh, that was in 2001 so um that would be let's see uh, wow uh 17 18 years ago uh, uh so i must have been 20 something like you know i was still pretty young back then so um you know three years there about eight years at ea uh, and then um, I basically ended up here at, at the coalition. Now, the, uh, um, the coalition wasn't called the coalition back then. Um, it was uh, a, a studio called Zipline, and we were working on some, you know, un unannounced title that we were developing. And so that was quite fun, actually. And as, uh, you know, one day, um, basically, you know, it was announced that the, the title that we were working on was, was going to be put aside and Microsoft had bought the Gears franchise and that we were going to work on it. So uh, obviously for me, that was, you know, I was upset for about five seconds because I really liked what we were working on. And then I got <laughs> super excited because I've, I've been a Gears fan. You know, I played Gears 1 when it came out. It just blew me away. I uh, played Gears 2 and 3, of course. But the, the biggest thing for me, I love the game, but I also actually love the art more. You know, um, when Gears 1 came out, it was leading the industry and in sort of the art they were doing, the style was, you know, came out of nowhere, just kind of blew everyone away. And I was always sort of infatuated with learning more about it, you know, looking at all the, the art blasts and, and, and sort of when they would put out like, the, you know, the, the ballistic books and stuff like that. I was always nerding out over all that stuff. So all of a sudden I couldn't believe, you know, to be honest, my luck that 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 this franchise had been purchased by Microsoft and now we were, were going to be working on it. So, you know, it, it was just kind of a dream come true there. And I guess the rest is history. You know, I worked on um, uh, uh, the Ultimate Edition uh, reboot for Gears 1. And then I was the associate art director working with uh, Kirk Gibbons, who was the art director for Gears 4. And then now I'm the art director for Gears 5 and we've shipped Gears 5. So uh yeah i mean it's been quite a journey yeah so uh your your, your current job title is art director on a game um uh, right. on <clears throat> gears 5 so on a game with this scale what are your daily tasks and also how does one become an art director um sure so um, i'll tackle those separately <laughs> those two big questions um i think you know what i've noticed is when I look at the team um, of artists that I work with, uh, I generally, they tend to fall into sort of two categories. Uh, one category is kind of, uh, the way I describe it is the artists who just want to put their headphones on and make, you know, awesome art. You know, they're kind of, you know, the, that's, that's the joy they get is out of making the art. Um, and, and they want to be specialists at their craft. And then eventually you start seeing certain, certain artists they're also more interested in talking to others and, and the organizational side of it and the direction as to why are we doing it this way? You know, um, they're not just, they don't just want to do the art, but they also want to figure out why it's being done that way and how it ties into the bigger picture. Right. So you start seeing a little bit of a difference in, in, in what people are sort of interested in. Uh, and those are the people that generally end up moving into art direction. Um, what they tend to do is, they tend to become area leads. So, you know, they're, they're not only just um, 
uh, uh, doing art, but they're also maybe managing a couple of people and helping them along and giving them some direction. Of course, you need some years under your belt to to have enough, uh, you know, to have enough experience to be able to to be able to kind of know what you're talking about. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. And eventually that that leads into sort of, you know, um, taking over a certain part of the game, a small part of the game and and making some artistic decisions, uh, working with the current art director to make sure everything's still good. And, you know, that's sort of the path, you know, you, you work your way up. Now, there's a million different ways to get to this. You know, sometimes you'll get an art director from film who comes over to video games. And so that's a different path. But uh, that's sort of a a vague explanation, I guess, um, or a high level explanation of, you know, how people generally end up getting into art direction. Um, you know, and there's lots of different kinds of art directors. There's art directors who are just focused on the art. There's art directors who are much more organized. So their job entails a lot of other things. And this is probably a good segue to get into um, sort of what my day to day is like. Uh, it, it's really different depending on the size of your team, you know, if you're art directing a team of 10 people, you know, versus, you know, we've got, we've had upwards to 450 people in this building. I mean, they're not all artists, but our team size is huge and has been. So um, I think that the biggest, the biggest key to, to sort of getting a vision across to a large group of people is, is having a high level um, vision that um, enables those people to make decisions and make the right decisions. So I'm not, not gonna be able to be there every day. Uh, I'm not, I can't look at everything. There's just way too much stuff going through. So I rely on the leads to be able to make the right decisions without me being there. Yeah. And if they, if they make like 10 decisions and eight of them are right and two of them are wrong, but they're making their own decisions, that's great. You know, that's okay. I can come in and fix the other two, right? But there's no way for me to make all those decisions. So the key is to sort of, you know, we have a pretty, pretty robust hierarchy here. You know, I work with uh, Jamie McNulty, who's the associate art director, and, and, and we're really partners in this. And we sort of divide the team up into chunks that he kind of manages and chunks that I manage. And there's lots of crossover, of course, we sit right next to each other. And um, basically, uh, you know, we're really aligned with those leads. And so when they go out and talk to their team, now the team is aligned with the leads and, and it just kind of works its way down, down the uh, waterfall. Uh, you know, of course, it's like a big game of telephone. So the further you get, the more things change every time. It's, it's So, you know, you want to make sure you have, you know, a high level style guide that that's that's presented to, to the team lots of times uh, early in the project. And, and people kind of go, you know, I'm, I have a decision to make now. Let me look. Let me think about the principles of our game. What are the things we're trying to do? You know, uh, um, you know what? Uh, what are the high-level pillars of the art? And then they make that decision. And if I've explained that stuff properly, you know, like I said, eight times out of ten, they've made the right decision. Um, the funny thing about art direction is, um, it's not just about sort of picking. What, you know, to simplify things, what color something should be or whatever. Uh, it's about sort of. Uh, making sure the appropriate decisions are made to support the game you're trying to make. So if everyone understands what game you're trying to make and what the, the high level goals for the art are, theoretically, everyone should be able to make decisions that are correct. So, you know, it's really all about laying down that foundation. Now, if you go to a team that that's much smaller, you know, art directors wear different hats, they could be even producing art, you know, so this is, you know, this is very specific to my, my role. And so, um, you know, one of the downsides to being in this role with a team this big is I'm in, I'm in a lot of meetings. You know, I'm in meetings for probably 75% of my day, um, which, you know, depending on how you look at meetings is good or bad. But uh, the way I decided to look at it is this is where decisions are made. This is where I get to communicate with people. So, um, you know, yes, I'm sitting in a room uh, and I'm not looking at you know, art, but I'm, I'm kind of in a meeting talking about art and, but, but that's an important part of the job. And then the other 25% I spend, you know, at artist desks and reviews and that kind of thing. And, you know, that's of course the funnest part of the job is sort of sitting with someone um, and talking about what they're doing, trying to, you know, get the best out of them, uh, you know, which is sort of leads me to the other, the other part of the job is I think it's really important 
for the art director to sort of inspire the team, a team that's inspired by a vision or, or something, they, they will give you their best work. And uh, I think if someone on the team is not giving you their best work, then I think it's the art director's responsibility to figure out why. Am I not describing the, to them what I need? Um, or are they just not inspired? Or is it someone who's in, the, in, in a position doing something Thing where they really feel like they should be in a different position. So I think it's really important at the end of the day to um, to kind of make a promise to your team. You know, we're a pretty hardworking um, our team here, and I think you know what I like to tell the guys is like you know we're, we're going to push you pretty hard, but at the end of the day, the work that you make here is going to be the best work on your portfolio. You know, so so it's kind of like a bargain. You know, um, you come here. We'll work together. You're going to get pushed, but you're going to do really good work. So I think it's really important for the art director to sort of figure out what they want the team culture to be and then, you know, represent that culture uh, throughout the team and keep people excited, you know, because three years working on something, it's a long time. So, you know, you can kind of get in a rut and sort of feel like, you know, oh, my God, we've been working on the same thing for so long. So uh, it's a big responsibility to make sure the team is excited. They, they feel fresh and, and they feel engaged. Yeah. So uh, when the project is this big and the team uh, is this huge, uh, you don't get to produce art yourself that much, right? So you ever miss the, those days? <laughs> You're missed to be replaced by like, oh, I want to just make, make a concept here. I want to work on this character instead of going to meetings or. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do miss it for sure. Um, I don't make much art. Uh, now I do get to, you know, the closest thing to making art I get to do is paint overs. Um, uh, you know, I do a lot of paint overs on existing things like uh, lighting paint overs, mood paint overs, or just some, you know, it could be uh, just composition or something for, for a level. Uh, or, uh, you know, a character will take a screenshot and start drawing what I feel like the armor is not quite where it should be or whatever. So that's still quite fun. Um, you know, it's not quite like making art because I'm trying to get, basically what I'm thinking is what's the least amount of work I have to do on this drawing to get my point across, you know? Yeah. So I'm not necessarily trying to make it look pretty. <laughs> uh -huh. So... So I don't get that. I don't get that satisfaction out of it. But um, I do miss it. You know, there's just a time. There's kind of a time where uh, I'm trying to figure out when it was. Maybe um, early on when I was working at the coalition, or maybe towards the end of my career or my time at EA, where um, I started getting a little bit freaked out because I, I was finding that. You know, I was opening up the latest version of Maya and I was finding that I couldn't remember where stuff was. You know, I, I couldn't really model the way I used to before, that kind of thing. And it was like, what am I doing? You know, like it feels very unnatural to push yourself into an area where you're actually, uh, you know, on purpose sort of abandoning a bunch of skills and trying to develop a whole bunch of new skills. But I think, you know, at that point, I kind of decided, you know, like I'm going to go all out towards being an art director. This is, you know, I think I'm good at it. Uh, and I think I have a lot of growth to do. And I, I can't really have one foot, you know, on one side and one foot on the other if I really want to go uh, go full speed. So, you know, that feeling goes away as you, as you start to art direct a little more and you start to, you know, you put out your first game that you've art directed and you're like, hey, I did it, you know, and it looks good. People like it. So, you know, the feeling sort of goes away or the feeling scared goes away. But I, I still do miss it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So uh, I'm a music composer and sound designer. When I want to come up with an idea for music, I try to look at very different things rather than music or <clears throat> sounds. How is your approach? Where is the well of inspiration for you? And how do you translate your surroundings and experiences into a presentable piece of art or an approach? Sure. That's a great question. Um, I mean, I'm inspired by... And by so much stuff, you know, I, I, I look at a lot of, I consume a lot of movies and film and media that way, of course. Um, you know, I, I look at tons of games that come out. Um, you know, my gaming time is limited. So uh, sometimes I just have to watch playthroughs on YouTube or whatever. You know, I look at all the art blasts that come out. I get all the art books. You know, we got a big collection of video game art books here. So, um, and then, you know, 
all sorts of different things. I, I'm constantly collecting images on like Instagram, you know, of, of, of whatever, something that inspires me. It might be just an image with two colors in it that I think work well together or a composition or whatever, you know. I try to sort of bombard myself with as much as much as I can, be it, you know, going to the art gallery, going, you know, traveling, all sorts of things. And and I kind of feel like um, if you put if you just keep funneling stuff in, uh, whatever comes out has a little bit of everything that went in with it. Do you know what I mean? I might not yeah. be explaining it. But so, um, you know, uh so with Gears Five, there's lots of little tidbits in there from from lots of little places that 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 sort of that that sunk in, you know, um, uh, you know, like Gears Five is 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 a really colorful game, and and there's a lot of different changes from one level to another, you know, has a really wide spectrum, and and that kind of you know Gears Four had a bit of that as well for sure. It was it was the biggest deviation from old Gears art direction. And this was Kirk's, uh, uh, Kirk Gibbons, Gears 4 art director. Uh, his passion was to bring color to the franchise and hit it really strong. And, and you know, when I, I can kind of remember when I played um, a Destiny 2, when that came out, I was really surprised by how many different looks you were getting at, at such quick intervals. And and every level you, you played through or area you went through, you really left a, a memory in your mind of the strong color palette that existed there. Yeah. So so when we were kind of approaching Gears 5, I was like, well, that's what I want to do. Like Gears 4 already had color in it. You know, the biggest shift is is not from Gears 4 to Gears 5. It's from Gears 3 to Gears 4, where we go from sort of more monochromatic to, to colorful. So I was like, well, what's our approach going to be to, to color? And so, you know, what we tried really hard is to um, uh, uh, hit each area, each level with, with a really strong tone. Uh, uh, a contrast mood. So when you're done, that leaves a mark that that, that lets you remember that that always kind of sinks in. And you know that again, that came from sort of playing Destiny two and going, wow, they they're you know they're not super worried about where this color is coming from. They're just putting the color in. Yeah. And you know that you have to kind of give up give up on reality a little bit. You know, Gears isn't really a realistic game. It's a very stylish game. So you know, so that that kind of came from there. Um, you know, I've been, uh, I've been watching a lot of, um, uh, you know, one thing the guys here probably will laugh if they see this, but I've been uh, telling all the artists uh, nonstop to go watch Handmaid's Tale, um, which is a, which is a TV show, but the composition, the color and just the cinematography uh, and, and some symbolism actually is just off the charts. So I watch that and I'm like, wow, we gotta we gotta find a way to get more of this stuff in for Gear Six. So it's just a constant wheel, you know, that that kind of keeps keeps going. Um, you know, I do some photography, I do some stuff like that to 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 keep myself kind of engaged and and keep my artistic brain sort of constantly sort of moving forward. Yeah, you know, in Gears Five, the desert level. When mm -hmm. I first saw that, and I was like. This is the most unique desert I've ever seen. This is this is all red. This is beautiful. It was amazing. But, what was the inspiration behind that? Uh, yeah, I'm really glad you said that because that was our intent. Um, so we knew we were going to do a desert level. Uh, I was really worried because, um, you know, a few games have, have come out in the last three, four years that have done desert really well. You know, Battlefield 1. Uh, you know, Mass Effect. Like, I was just like, how are we? We can't just do another realistic looking desert because, you know, um, part of the thing with our desert is it's part of the our game that is a little bit more open worldy. It's not really open world, but it's the largest scale. So I knew that that would mean that the fidelity of the art, fidelity of the art would have to go down to be able to support 60 frames per second at, at the size of level. And I was just worried that we would get compared to to those games and just get destroyed. So um, I just thought to myself, what's the biggest thing we can do to make this look totally different? Like we need an ownable desert. Like if someone looks at a picture of the desert level in Gears, they need to know, oh, that's Gears. Not like, is that, you know, what am I looking at? Is that a picture? Is that another game? And so, you know, 
aside from the rocks, which are pretty unique, like the large cliffs and stuff. And that was kind of the easier part because we were able to concept that out and, and figure out a shape we all like, but that was kind of unique, but I think was was sort of the red sand. So I was like, okay, how, how red can we make the sand um, before people's kind of eyes start to hurt, you know? <laughs> Before so, they feel it like, oh, it's blood over yeah, everywhere. That's right. And and so immediately there was quite a bit of resistance um, on the team. Um, you know, one of the things that, that uh, people were worried about is that it would look like Mars. And so, you know, that that's okay. We did a, you know, we put together a little board that showed, you know, photography from Mars. And the funny thing is, the way people think Mars looks isn't really the way Mars looks. Like if you look at the photos from all the rovers and stuff that have landed on Mars, it looks a lot different than when you go watch a movie. Yeah, yeah. About yeah risk. Space. Risk. That's right. So so there was like it kind of was like a deep dive into what this planet actually looks like. And what we sort of realized is um, you can have red sand or orange sand, but as long as you keep the sky not orange, then you don't really fall into that Mars. Mars look. And uh, the other thing was, I didn't want it to be orange because I actually, for my sensibility, I can look at that much orange. That's what bothered me. But if we made it deeper red and had some magenta, then then that to me was like, okay, I can look at this. And then, you know, of course, to take it a level further, um, you know, you need to break up. You can't just have a flat surface of red. You need to break it up. So we have the, you know, the crystal layer underneath. So as the as the skiff moves around, you can see the crystals from underneath, which is basically because there's so many storms. Uh, um, you know, uh, it creates it creates so much heat that it just crystallizes the sand. So over the years, basically, the red sand is sitting on top of a black layer. Um, and of course, that was inspired by by Star Wars, which has a, had that really cool scene where, you know, they had the wh white sand on top of the red sand. And I was like, well, there's got to be a way for us to take that and put it in our game. <laughs> so, you know, and, and basically... Um, it was a bit of a struggle because people were like, we need, we need to pull back on the red. We need to pull back on the red. And, and so my main goal, and, and I, I talked to Jamie McNulty about this a lot. I was like, look, um, we need to keep the vibrancy of the red. If it's bothering people, then let's add more bushes or let's add more black breakup or whatever. But the red can't get less vibrant because so that is what's going the game during these times, doing making decisions for arts, like on people. Like, play this and tell me if it hurts you or not. Uh, not like that. I mean, at that point, it's mostly feedback from the team themselves, you know. Um, but uh, we do have certain... Uh, uh, points in our game where we do, you know, a wider test, like a UR test, uh, user research test. But at that point, the art was like, we weren't going to change the color of the sand by then. That was pretty late in the project. So, um, so I think, you know, the thing for me is if, if people don't like it, if some people don't like it, that's not reason enough for me to change it. So what I want to do is if I put 10 people in the room And five of them go, oh, my God, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. And five of them go, oh, I can't look at that. It's horrible. I actually think that's pretty good yeah. because I'm causing a visceral reaction, either good or bad, but I'm getting a strong reaction. And especially you know? uh, considering that this level comes after the last level, which happens in, to, in uh, snow. It's all that's white right. and yeah. suddenly it's all yeah. red. And I that's really right. <laughs> uh, consider it's a big me as one of those people yeah. who say, wow, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I'm glad. So, you know, so that's what was happening. People were like, this is incredible. Don't change it. And some people were like, we can't ship this. You know, people aren't <laughs> going to be able to play this for more than five minutes. And so... Um, I guess that kind of comes down to, you know, one of the things that Kirk Gibbons taught me when, when he was here as our director was if you want to leave a mark, like a lasting impression, you've got to hit it really hard, yeah. you know, because there's, there's just so much stuff out there that people look at something and within a minute they get used to it and then they forget it, you know. So I just really kept that in the back of my head the whole time. And I was like, we're not going to we're not going to make this any less red because I want it to hit hard. And, and, and it has, and, you know, now in hindsight, I'm glad, uh, um, you know, no one's been complaining about it being too red and people are saying they love it. So, so, you know, it worked out. <laughs> yeah. Great. So Gears 5 is, I guess, 
the most ambitious entry in the series. And to be honest, a lot of people were kind of worried if it's going to work out or not. And they were all proven wrong afterwards, of course. <laughs> Finishing the game, I was amazed how each moment of this game is perfectly tailored to be fresh and yet loyal to the glorious values of the past. Visually, the game is probably the most advanced game I've ever played. And as, and as I told you before, my PC is a monster, so I've experienced everything in its glory. It looks so fresh, but yet so familiar. And visually, I'm sure that the main reason behind this great achievement is you. So, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Gears is always about discovering a unique place on a different planet, gearing with a bunch of cool people mm -hmm. as a squad, and going to discover all sort of crazy stuff to accompany these feelings. The sense of curiousness is one of the strongest and, uh, I think, unique elements of Gears series. So, and you, sir, I think you understood this perfectly because every location in Gears 5 is huge and well detailed. And there are, uh, and <clears throat> there are many elements uh, yet left to the imagination of the players. Say a huge tornado is visible in the distance. Hammer of Dawn is visible attacking far away. A huge boulder or a mountain makes you wonder what kind of mystery is in that area. Uh, so this game, I believe, is a smart in environmental storytelling. And I have to thank you for giving the players some more space to think about and imagine on themselves rather than giving every detail of this location to them. Uh, tell me about your approach toward creating the world of Gears 5. Sure. Um, before I answer your question, I, I think I just want to make sure to to sort of mention that, like, this is such a group effort here. Um, you know, everything you've mentioned is, is, let me assure you, it's not just me. Uh, from our tech art team, uh, Colin Penty, our technical art supervisor, um, technical art director, sorry, who, who I partner with, who, who really, without whom would not be possible to deliver this much content at 4K, at 60, at, you know. So, um, you know, all this stuff involves a big, big team of people. Uh, one of the great things about working at the coalition is, um, you know, we don't really care where the good ideas come from as long as they're good ideas and those ideas can float to the top and, and make it into the game. You know, we're very transparent as far as our hierarchy goes in that way. So anyway, I want to say thank you, but also say that it definitely is not just me. <laughs> it's a huge group effort. Um, now, to, uh, to answer your question, uh, environmental storytelling is a really um, important part of Gears. Uh, I don't think in, in Gears 4 we did a great job of doing that. Um, there was a lot of reasons. You know, on Gears 4, we, we were it was the first time our team was making a game of this scale. Not just that, it was the first time we were making a Gears product. So, you know, we were just holding on, trying to do the best we could. Uh, so a lot of things ended up coming in late. For example, our levels were already built, and then we tried to go back in and, and tell stories within those levels. And of course, you know, you have some success doing that, but it doesn't doesn't give you the best result. So you know, Gears Four was sort of our training grounds, and uh, when Gears Five started, one of the high level art pillars was uh, was improved environment storytelling. And so it's easy to just say that. So how do we want to do that? So one of the things we did was we embedded um, our, narrative our narrative team with our environment team, with the design team, all together at the very beginning of when a level was going to get start started wow. to be created. Yes. Yeah, so it's, you know, it, it, sound well, it sounds pretty straightforward. It's just on Gears 4, we really didn't even have the wherewithal to, we were just trying to make the game yeah. and not, you know, and make a good game. <laughs> not, you know, so... Um, Anyway, so this resulted in in all these conversations about like what are we putting in the background? Uh, you know, wait, narrative is here. What do you think? Like, is there something you can come up with that you know, like if you look in a corner and a fan who's played Gears, you know, all this the whole series is going to recognize something and go, oh my god, that's you know, the, those lights in Mount Kadar, they're the shape of the locust symbol. Oh my god, is that why the locusts use that as their symbol? You know, little things like that. You don't get that that sort of synergy between the teams if everyone's sort of doing things separately. So that was a huge, I mean, it was a simple step to take, but it, the results were, were really good. Um, and then, you know, 
uh, we're always kind of looking to to cram as much as we can into each space. You know, I want I want the lighting to be as impactful in each space. I want the environmental storytelling, the composition, of course. You know, you can't make a game that runs at 100% the whole way from the art perspective. We just don't have the capability to do that. So you naturally end up with little ups and downs. But um, the thing that I've tried to do is every time we get into a spot where you can stop for a minute and pause and maybe look around a little bit, that's the spot where you double down. You go, you go 100% in that spot. And then you let it go down a little bit, oh. you know. Now we walk through some hallways for a bit. No big deal. We can let the arts take a back seat, you know. So um, one thing that really helps with that is when we first design out our levels, we, we kind of think about each section of the level and what is important for that section of the level. So, for example, if we're in a big combat space, the combat is king in that space. So we're not going to put a huge vista in the background we're not going to spend time doing a bunch of different stuff because you're in the middle of combat you don't even really have time to appreciate that and then there's certain parts of the level where there's no combat and you're just in a walk volume and we say okay the goal of this section is to show off this part of the art um, or to show you destruction and in the first level the facility where you drop down into the water there is a lot of that. You'll notice something will happen and it's showcasing either a big geocache VFX moment or it's showcasing, you know, water or whatever. So, um, you know, it, it's really important to kind of figure out what the priorities are uh, for every part of the level and then let the other pieces fall back a bit and let that piece shine, you know. Uh, that way the team's aren't fighting each other they're actually working together and then you end up you know you end up with an experience where you're like wow that was awesome there was great combat there was awesome visuals there's a moment where it was really quiet but you could hear the water droplets so you could hear you know the trident audio kicking in so it, it's all about sort of um planning that out and then and then each team sort of backing the other team like uh there's a couple spots in the game where you know where uh, as you fight, the atmosphere in the room picks up and it gets thicker. And there's every time something is destroyed, like a pillar, you know, we turn up the fog and the smoke in the room. So that's all done so that when the juvies come running in later, you can't see them. So all this kind of thing where, uh, you know, art is really trying to help out and bolster gameplay. And then gameplay at times slows down to help art shine. So, I mean, that kind of thinking in the approach that's, you know, really ends up with a good result where it feels like all the parts are helping each other, not fight against each other. Yeah. So, uh, what was the most exciting part of working on Gears 5 for you? To be very specific about it. Um, wow, it's a great question. There's so much. It's hard to parse out. Let me see. Um, I think, you know... I can break it down in a few different sort of um, uh, categories. You know, the, mo the best part about my job is interacting with the team. Like, you know, like you, like we've already talked about, I don't really get to make art anymore. So um, the best part is when I, when I have an interaction with a team or a group of artists or whatever, and then the result comes out and we're all like, oh my God, that's awesome. Like that is the best part. And, you know, to get more specific, one of the things we've always wanted to do is, is have, atmosphere in our game that is lit lit better you know um and is a little bit thicker and you know more god rays and that kind of stuff and and that came out of a lot of work from our, our tech art team colin and and uh uh and james sharp who did a lot of the heavy lifting with the volumetric system uh systems in our game so that was a very exciting moment when when we realized that we really could make our game as atmospheric as we wanted and let that react to light properly um you know uh, the other part that that stands out for me is you know kate kate being our our you know main character it was really important that we get kate looking right not just her face but her armor um you know we're doing this winter armor that hasn't been done before um and also we kind of wanted to make sure kate's face looked you know kate looks it's not that she's aged between gears four and gears five but she's experienced some yeah, heavy yeah, things. Exactly. Yeah, like she, you know, she basically has to kill her mom at the end of Gears Four. So, uh, you know, 
what is that? How do we do that? How do we make it look like she looks, you know, like she's grown inside because of the experiences that, that she's had without just adding years to her face? That took a long time to get. You know, we went too far. We came back. Um, and, of course, making sure we're, we stay away from the uncanny valley. Again, Gears is not about realism, but we're always flirting with yeah. that line, style versus realistic. So I think, you know, we, we were like, we've done it. It looks awesome. And then a month later, we would all look at it and go, oh, my God, what are we doing? Kate's face isn't right. <laughs> you know, we worked on Kate, um, Bruno, uh, uh, our, our uh, lead character artist, worked on Kate the whole project, you know. Um, at times we'd put it down for a month and then we'd go back and his patience is incredible. And it basically got to a point where I was really happy with it. Uh, I sent Rod Ferguson, of course, our studio head, a picture of Kate's face, a close up, like a really close, close up. And I was a little bit, um, I was anxious to see what his reaction would be. And he sent me an email saying, you know, I think it looks awesome. Good job. And I was super happy. And then I went home and, you know, I was, I don't know, I was watching TV or something and it was around midnight and my phone, an email came to my phone and I looked at it and it was Rod. And he, and it was just, it, it was the picture. And he said, I can't stop looking at this. It looks so fucking awesome. <laughs> so, so that's when I knew, you know, okay, we've, we've, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, Rod is sort of, uh, you know, he, his, his standard for quality is so high that, that having him here is, is super valuable to me, not just me, the team, but to me personally in, in that, you know, I push really hard. He's going to push even harder. So if we're both happy, we've really got something. So that was a really, really exciting moment for me. <laughs> um, I think another, another kind of fun moment was pretty late in the project. Uh, uh, Greg Mitchell, our cinematic director and I, um, we had pitched, uh, the title sequence for the game, um, you know, Kate's nightmare. And, um, uh, we, we kind of had to figure out a way to get it funded and figure out a, a team to do it, which ended up being the, the team at Elastic. Uh, and when that thing all came together, um, that was a very exciting moment for me. It let us kind of create a more polished sort of intro to our game. You know, we've got the previous Leon Gears and then the title sequence, and then Kate wakes up. Uh, without, the, without the title sequence, she wouldn't be waking up from anything. Uh, so, so I really am happy with the quality of that work. Working with Noah Harris and that team was awesome, and, and Greg, of course. So uh, that was a really big moment towards the end where, you know, we were just trying to button the game up, and this thing came out, and it was super creative and collaborative, and, and that was really fun to work on as well. Yeah, speaking of Kate, actually, now that I yeah. think about uh, what you said, it is really obvious that he, 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 she hasn't been aged, but she's more mature. She's yeah. now ready to take control. And especially, this is a very great thing about Gears 5, that throughout the game, until the very end of the game, she's trying to uh, make the squad work together, Delta Squad. There are always uh, disagreements between these characters, and uh, they're not working together very good as 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 much as Marcus and his friends did back uh, back mm -hmm. at their times. But Kate is very mature, and uh, looking at her, and especially uh, the voice acting of um, her. Uh, she is really understandable, relatable, and she, she has changed. Uh, between mm -hmm. Gears 4 and 5 and I can't see I can't wait to see where she goes in the next one so yeah, yeah great job <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you let's go uh, as always I ask people on Twitter to ask their questions from the guests sure. and I'm going to read some of them and hopefully sure. they'll have their answers so you ready sure okay the first first guy has the same name as you Arian underline oh. HM has asked Gears of Gears 5 feels a lot like previous Gears 1, 2, 3, visually and more appealing, of course. What were the key changes from Gears 4 to 5 visually that made it this way? Um, sure. So I would classify it a little bit differently. I would say that, 
you know, Gears 1 had this very monochromatic sort of look. Um, that was, uh, you know, that was kind of a popular look for a Yeah, war. back in those days, Metal Gear, Gears 4, Fallout, they yeah. all were so dark and... <laughs> Yeah, and and film as well, right? Like you look at you look at you look at war movies. It's always sort of this this desaturated look, right? And 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 Gears One wanted to be a cinematic experience. You know, the HUD is very limited. Uh, you know, all those decisions were made because they wanted to make it feel like you were you were having this cinematic experience. And so Gears Two very similar. Gears Three you start seeing a little bit more color come into, but still very sort of muted. Uh, and um, so I think the biggest change, uh, like I mentioned earlier, is, it w you would see from Gears 3 to Gears 4. You know, Gears 4, you know, you play to rescue, it's nighttime, but the moon is so bright. It's almost like it's almost like daytime night, you know, and there's so much blue in the scene. So I think that's the biggest, uh, to me, that's the biggest shift. Now, um, the thing that maybe people are relating Gears 5 a little bit back to, Gears one, two, and three is um, Gears four was happened in a very short time span. You know, it was I think two days or forty eight hours or something really short. The characters only went through a few locations. There wasn't that many different looks, you know. And I think um, Gears five obviously is way different. The time span, you know, we go, you know, there's a four months later kind of thing happens, um, and that really enables us to uh, go through so many different locations. And so I think maybe one of the things that maybe your your um, the person asking the question is is feeling is that you know Gears Five feels a little bit because of more varied spaces. It feels a little bit more like yeah. old Gears, not to go to a lot of different places in that way. But but to answer the question of, of the difference between Gears Four and Gears Five, I think you know Gears Four really set the foundation for Gears Five. Um, so you know we at the beginning of Gears Five we thought to ourselves, okay, what what did we do on Gears Four that we liked? We're going to keep doing that. Uh, what do we do on Gears 4 that we tried to do but didn't turn out that well? We're going to do that as well, but do it the best version of that, you know? And then what are the new things? What are the absolute new things we're going to add to Gears 5? And so I think, you know, the biggest difference is you see so many more varied locations that that you're getting a lot of different colors, right? It's like like the different slices. It's like a rainbow, you know, like you were saying, you go from the ice world to the desert, you know, you start in the forest, you know, you get a bit of everything. I think people are reacting to that variety. But I think Gears 5 is a much more atmospheric, uh, moody, and sort of volumetric fog, uh, god rays, you know. Uh, there's a lot of times where you walk into a space and the light is pointed right at you. We generally don't do this, you know. It's it's not a great look that often, unless you can fill the air with atmosphere and give you nice god rays and put something in front of that, between you and the light source to create a shadow. You know, a lot of that stuff we couldn't do so well on Gears Four because of technical limitations. So, um, so I think you know, as I said, I think Four is definitely was a stepping stone for Five, but uh, Five is you know bigger, more more moody, more colorful, and just just really. Um, scale wise much much bigger yeah speaking of light I don't think I've ever been this much obsessed with light in a game and, and I really I was, I was st just staying standing somewhere in Gears 5 and watching the light and just uh, thinking about how did they do that especially things like uh, light going past through transparent objects that yeah. is revolutionary in Gears Five, and I was like, "Wow, this really changes the deal." And again, the lens flare in Gears Five—it's something really, really different than other games. And I'm glad that you guys used lights more when you have this capacity of technical um, progression in the game. So, yeah, it yeah. looks fantastic. Thank you. I'm glad you say that. I mean, I'm I'm obsessed with lighting, um, probably. To the dismay of the lighting team, as I spend quite a bit of time in the lighting room, you know, and and we we spend a lot of time giving them feedback. We do lots of concepts and stuff like that. Um, I just feel, you know, everything all the other teams do can either be highlighted with good lighting or just completely sort of left flat yeah, with that. Yeah. So uh, it's such an important step, um, and uh, you know, 
I, I like it to be dramatic. So, um, you know, that's how we lit it. And, uh, you know, if, if you like what you see there, you really should go watch The Handmaid's Tale. It's quite, it's quite incredible. Actually, I've watched from- the first episode of the series, but I couldn't take it anymore. So yeah, dark it's, it's pretty dark. It's pretty dark. <laughs> so you can know, all just put it on mute and just watch the beautiful visuals. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Next question is from at the Burnt Firefly. What was the most challenging thing about making GS5 a uh, kind of open world game? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I would hesitate to call us open world. You know, we have we have RPG and open world elements, but I know, I know what, what the intent of the question is. Um, I think the most like, Oh my God, it's so hard to make the spaces as big as we did. So the desert space is much larger than the ice space. So it came with so much more challenge. I mean, if you think about the things that you have to consider is you're going from a linear level that is super dense with props and vegetation and everything. And then you hop on the skiff and all of a sudden you can only afford a quarter of that density. Like, how are we going to make that look okay? Like, are people going to be okay with that? Um, There's all sorts of issues with lighting, um, memory. Uh, So, I mean, I really have to hand it to to our our engineering and and, uh, tech art teams here. Um, They did an incredible job. You know, I was quite worried. I was thinking, oh, my God, they are going to do something to the art where there's no way it's going to run fast and look good at this scale. You know, and, and of course, it's always a compromise. But but working with the team here was was kind of, of course, we had to make some decisions that were tough, you know, uh, but keeping the bigger picture in mind. Um, I think, you know, probably one of the toughest parts was figuring out how to light these worlds, you know, like just how, how are we going to light this? You know, we've got one dynamic light, uh, but then you're outside and that's fine. It's a sunny day. But what are we going to do when you walk into one of the, like the pump house or whatever, one of the little points of interest or whatever, that now that one light is not enough. We have to light the inside, but we can't really afford light or the light map resolutions have to be small. So um, it was quite, quite challenging. I don't know if we, um, we knew it would be a challenge, didn't quite know how hard it would be, uh, but I'm so happy with the end result and how people are receiving it that um, it totally makes it all worth it. Yeah. Next one's coming from at Amir for Honor NRZ. I was working with Rod Ferguson. Actually, a lot of people are curious about Rod. Maybe I'll do a podcast with him yeah. too in the future. <laughs> yeah, he. Um, yeah, I mean, so Rod Ferguson's our studio head. He also, you know, fills the role of creative director here. Uh, working with Rod is incredible. Um, I've never in my career before before working with Rod, I never worked with someone that. I mean, he knows this franchise inside and out. Yeah. Like, it's unbelievable. The amount of knowledge, uh, he's he's obviously a super smart guy. Um, the amount of stuff he retains, I'm always in awe of. Someone like me who struggles to remember things, and I'm always, you know, um, I'm always like, what's the name of that thing? Like, it's just incredible uh, um, uh, having him here. I love working with Rod on it, just more specifically on, on the art He's a great partner to have. Um, you know, it, the thing that I like that forces working with him forces me to always try to be at the top of my game. You know, um, I do my best work when I'm when I'm when I'm around people like that because uh, I always am very self-critical and I'm always thinking to myself, I better get my 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 work right because if I don't, you know, Rod's going to see through it. He's going to challenge me on the things that I've shown him. So. Uh, I get a, I get a lot of satisfaction in being able to show him something and have him be happy with it and know that like he's thinking about it at a super deep level. And if what I've done, if he's happy with what I've done, that means that I've answered the questions myself before I, I, I showed him something. You know, of course, he's he's um, he's basically, you know, he's a closer, you know, like he he pushes us, you know, to close the game down. He knows when to push and he knows when it's time to shut it down. So he's incredibly valuable from a production standpoint. Um, and he's, he's really a fun person to creatively problem solve with, uh, you know, spend lots of time in his office looking at art and, you know, we're both like, this isn't quite right, but we both don't know exactly why. 
and just sitting there for a couple hours and, and looking up different reference and going through, being able to have that kind of interaction with the studio head um, who's that available to the team and, and can have that much impact is, is really quite incredible. Uh, so um, I feel really lucky to be able to work with him and, and you know, um, it's one of the interactions I look forward to the most actually in the studio. So uh, it's really, really nice. Yeah, I gotta thank him for keeping the franchise alive and Absolutely. amazing yeah. like always. So uh, also the same person has asked about working with Ramin Javadi. Now I don't know if you were in were in contact with him during the production of the game or not, but please tell me about his music. Sure, um, I did get to work with him a little bit. So uh, you know, obviously our audio director Johnny Morgan has the most amount of uh, contact with Ramin. Uh, and he did, you know, compose the score for our game and all that stuff. But uh, the title sequence that I was mentioning earlier, he uh, he made, did the music for that as well. So I did get to interact with him a little bit uh, there. Obviously, I'm a big fan of his work. You know, he's done so much work that people know, and his and and the quality of the work is incredible. And so I was, you know, approaching it from the perspective of a fanboy, really. <laughs> so you know, so. That, uh, you know, so we had this title sequence. He laid down a bunch of music. He sent us his first pass. And I'm looking at an email that says, please send feedback. And I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> How am I going to send Ramin Jawadi feedback on the score? You know, like, this is crazy. Like, what the hell am I going to write? You know, so, of course, I just, you know, after I relaxed a little bit and, and kind of calmed down and said, okay, let's approach this. I was able to sort of, you know, I can't, I can't necessarily tell him what's wrong with the score from a note perspective or whatever, uh, nor would I try. But it was more, um, you know, like, okay, when I, I listen to this, here's what I feel. But if you look at the, the, the video, this is the low point. I think we need to get a little bit lower, that kind of thing. And, you know, he's such an incredible collaborator. You know, he can take a feedback from even someone like me who's completely art focused and, and has very little knowledge to be able to, you know, I guess knowledgeably speak about music that way and kind of read through what I wrote and go, oh, okay, I understand what you're saying. You know, don't worry, we're going to make, we're going to work on it. And we just, you know, he's such a true professional in that way that it was, it was really great. It was a very small amount of interaction, collaboration, mostly over email, a couple of phone calls. I think we went back and forth in a group, group setting. But uh, it was pretty incredible. And just kind of thinking that, you know, the, the people that I get to work with on this project just blows my mind. Yeah. So, uh, by the way, you play games much? And if so, what was the last inspiring game you've played? Uh, uh, sure. Um, I So, my, t my gaming time is very limited these days. So, I have two small kids at home. They suck up almost all my time. So... You know, um, I, I get a little bit of time here and there and, you know, I approach it mostly from like a research perspective. You know, I really need to play this game. I've heard it looks good. I got to see, you know, and and this is going to sound bad, but I actually don't want to like the game I'm playing because when if I really like it, then I just want to play more. And it feels like torture <laughs> that I don't have time to play. It. <laughs> but um, but, you know, uh, like I, I get a lot of inspiration from a lot of different games um you know one game just to go a completely different route uh one game that always inspired me is, is limbo you know the amount of depth that they get in a simple side scroller just by going with different values of light and dark is just incredible you know and and i'm always trying to get that much depth into our scenes like how can we get some parallax how can we get more silhouetting how can we get more you know that kind of thing of course you know more recent games god of war blew me away i didn't see that coming and I, I probably put a few too many hours into that late at night which caused some tired days um you know as i said from a color perspective De destiny 2 really stands out you know i'm a i'm a uh you know i'm a shooter guy i, I like playing shooters first person shooters really are kind of what i played growing up you know or uh, put the most hours in so anything battlefield related uh gets gets a little bit more time out of me than it should <laughs> but you know i'm really looking forward to uh you know last of us 2 very excited about that I had a big announcement yesterday so you know it, it's it's kind of spread around a little bit but but my true true sort of 
passion over the years has been first person shooters. Yeah. Have you had a chance to play Red Dead Redemption 2? Yes, I put a lot of hours into Red Dead. <laughs> That's one that kept me up a lot. You know, the funny thing about Red Dead, I mean, it's a beautiful game. It's incredible. Um, but, you know, for some reason, I just spend most of my time camping and hunting and fishing and just doing, you know, I played very, I got a ton of hours into the game, but I've gone very little as far <laughs> yeah. as, because I just, I just like the piece of it, you know, like finding, taking a place across the map that I had to ride my horse to and just take my time doing it, you know, all of a sudden two and a half hours have gone by. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I like that game a lot. Um, you know, it's one that I'll pick up probably for years, you know, half an hour, hour at a time, uh, and I'll never be able to finish it. <laughs> it's going to pay off because I believe if that amount of dedication is required in a game to just do simple things, you kind of get more attached to the universe and character of the game. Totally. And when yeah. you are getting at the ending, I'm not going to spoil anything, but it's going to okay. destroy you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome, Warian. I have to uh, finish the podcast, although I can talk to you over for like ages. But thank you for uh -huh. giving the fans a beautiful word, perfectly executed by the technicians and programmers at the Coalition. Thank you for being so cool and humble. And thank you for the team at the Coalition and especially Blaine Howard for making this a possibility. You guys are at the top of your game and keep it, keep it up chainsawing our brains with your great games. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate the chance to talk to you uh, and the team appreciates uh, your kind words. So um, uh, thanks and keep it up. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a good day, Bye. sir.